So let me know. I know this is a. I know the GDSHP crowd. So I know you'll let me know if it's not loud enough or if you can't see. Just feel free to signal. So thank you to GDSHP and to NPC. As Felicia mentioned, we did this last year and had um, quite a bit of fun. And it's actually something that with NPC we've been working on to kind of present these kind of online resource guides specific to neighborhoods. So what we're going to go through this evening, it's kind of rapid. Um, and I tried to pick things that are really appropriate for your neighborhood. So for Greenwich Village, some you can use in any neighborhood and some I just think are of more use in Greenwich Village than perhaps um, other neighborhoods. Oh, great. Thank you. So as um, Felicia mentioned, the resource sheet so you all got one of those. If you prefer it digitally, it will be on the NPC website. So we made that accessible. I will say, um, you know, it's teeny tiny mice type on the one that you got, but it still doesn't have everything on there. There are things, there's just, there's no way to include it all. So there are going to be resources on that handout that I'm not going to present tonight because we just don't have time. And even a few that I'll go through tonight that might not be on that sheet. Um, and also it's something, you know, there are constantly new things being added and made accessible online. So this is, you know, there are slight, slight tweaks to this presentation anytime, every time, because there's so much information out there. Um, so a few caveats before we, oh, yeah? Can you turn off the light on the right? So the light on the right, if anyone knows where that switch is. Yes, is that better for everyone you can kind of see? Yes. Yeah? Great. No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so we're good? All right. Thank you for the wave. I want everybody to be happy. So a few caveats before we start. Um, and this one is true. I'm not responsible if you get obsessed, which if you have kind of OCD tendencies or detective tendencies, these are all going to lead to that kind of spiral. You know, I don't want to hear from friends and family if they're sick of hearing about NB numbers and Boleyn searches and all that kind of stuff. Um, this is important too. This is, this is about online resources, things we can do, you know, from home in our comfortable clothes. But it doesn't mean that you're not going to need to go to repositories in person. I think that's really important. I view the online research as a great way to build a framework so that when you do go to an, an archive or repository, you're prepared and you're asking the right questions. You already have a baseline of information. And also a little plug, because most of the resources we're going to look at, they're only possible because places like New York Public, New York Historical, Museum of the City of New York, they're doing the work to put these online. So it's important that we also support their work. And then you can't trust everything you find online. And I am a natural skeptic about this kind of stuff. Um, this is something that I, I think is great, um, that actually my sister uses as a teaching tool with students. And I think it holds true and it's a good lesson. Students are very disappointed to learn there is no such thing as a Pacific Northwest tree octopus. And they say, but there's video, there's citations, there's a quote from a professor, there are all these sources. Um, so you can have all of those things, um, but still not maybe have a reliable source. And I think doing online research, it's basically following a thread, keeping really good notes. So that if you find a story that's totally enticing and intriguing, you make note of it and see if you can track down where that story originated. Because especially in the village, a lot of that is going to be really fabulous folklore. Um, and as long as you present it at, is at such, I think that's great because that's part of the history of the neighborhood. But it doesn't mean that it's necessarily fact. So we're going to go through um, a bunch of different types of resources. Um, so I had to kind of narrow them down. So we're going to look at designation reports, official records, maps, images, newspapers, and other publications. And then, come on in, that's okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. And then social history. So, you know, this is, I'm sure, a savvy crowd. Some of these you're going to be familiar with. 
Um, so I hope that everybody walks away with maybe just one new research tip or one new site that you can search. I would say you know, we all have different methods of researching. You might want to look for images before maps or newspapers before images, but I would say definitely start with the designation reports and the official records. That's going to be kind of your base to start with, particularly in Greenwich Village. So sample building. I chose in order to kind of illustrate the resource, resources we're going to use a sample building. So I chose 11 West A Street. I purposefully chose a 20th century building. You can certainly use the resources that I'm going to show you for 19th century buildings. I certainly do. But you're going to be able to use more of the resources with a 20th century building. That's just the nature of some of the records we're going to look at. And also I wanted to use a 20th century building because if you're familiar with the Greenwich Village Historic District Report from the 60s, there isn't as much information about some of those early 20th century buildings as there is about the early 19th and mid 19th century buildings. And I didn't cheat, I did just pick a building and then whatever I found, I, I found. I didn't you know, do research and find a bunch of stuff and then say that was gonna be my sample building. <laughs> So we're going to start with the designation reports, and there are a number of resources for finding those. And we're talking about both New York City local historic districts and individual landmarks, as well as state and national register of historic places. So you're really fortunate in Greenwich Village. Um, I would never say that any neighborhood has too many historic districts, but you have a wealth of information for your neighborhood. And even if, by chance, the building you're looking at falls outside of one of those districts, those reports can be a wealth of information about how the neighborhood developed, what architects or developers were active in that neighborhood. Um, and this actually is a, the GBSHP accomplishments map, which I think is still on their website. So you, it shows all the individual landmarks and historic districts. Um, also, the Neighborhood Preservation Center really saved us all a lot of time by putting the designation reports for New York City landmarks online. And it's a huge asset. It's a very easily searchable database. You can go to their website and there's a little for researchers section. And you can search by the title, by a keyword. If you want to just look through a borough, you can do that. All very simple and it will pull up a summary, and then also will link to a PDF, so you can actually download that designation report. Now, I will warn you that if you're not familiar, the Greenwich Village, Maine, 1969 historic designation report is two volumes, so it's pretty big. Um, so just be prepared with that. Um, you also have GBSHP on their website. They've kind of taken all of these different resources and put them on one page. So you see the little resources tab on their website, and it's going to send you, um, you can click on historic district and individual landmark designation reports. And they've got it all there. So if you're in Greenwich Village, you can go to their website, click on that link, and they'll have links to all the separate reports that you need. And then I also wanted to, as long as I'm talking about them, give a little plug for their blog, Off the Grid, which is really well researched. I really appreciate that they cite where they get the historic images from. They cite their sources, and they cover a lot of buildings within Greenwich Village. So that's just something to know about as long as you're on their website to do a search of that as well. So um, if we go back to their resource section, I'm going to, for my sample building, I'm going to click on the Greenwich Village Historic District. And it brings up the map, which shows me all of the different sections of that original historic district, and I've highlighted 8th Street in there, so I know the section to go to, and here's the little blurb it has about our sample building, and you can see it's brief, like compare it to the section above it, it's pretty brief, it gives a name, Brevoort Court, built in 1921, um, but it actually talks a bit more about the building that used to be there before this one was built. Um, so the information we get from it is the construction date, no architect, uh-oh, I didn't touch anything, there we go, no, I won't move, no architect, um, no owner, but we do have a use, and as an aside, I would say that 
The Historic District Report is a really fun read. I know that may sound odd, but there's a lot more commentary in that designation report than maybe we see in more current ones. So they offer some really interesting commentary on modern buildings, if you flip through it. So um, for our particular building, they just said that it's, you know, it's not offensive, basically, <laughs> is what they said about that. So we've got just minor information to start with, but it gives us something. Um, next, you could go back to GBSHP and link to the state website from there, but I thought it would be really good um, for you to know how to get directly there, and this is on the handout. Um, Chris, as the website is known, is for the New York State Historic Preservation Office, and it's still fairly new. They've updated their search system, and it's once you know the tricks, it's pretty good, and you can get a lot of information from this system. And you have to register as a um, either go as a guest or you can sign up. And it's going to bring up this little search window, and you're just going to click search, and you're going to click National Register. Okay. And so I obviously typed in Greenwich Village. It comes up with the historic district report. I click on the little magnifying glass, and then it brings up more details. And the reason the map all the way on the right is so critical is, this is complicated, but most New York City landmarks and historic districts are going to be on the state and national register, but not all state and national register listings are going to be New York City landmarks. So you could actually find something on here for which there is no local designation report. And the map shows you what else is kind of designated around it. Um, yeah, so it's only a little note. And you can click on attachments, and it will bring up you know, the records that it has. You can actually download the complete National Register form, and sometimes photos. So this is a great photo of the time when the designation was put through on the National Register. So it's a 1970s view of West 8th Street from the corner of 6th. Um, so some of these are now historic photos in their own right because the National Register districts were a while ago. Official records. Um, again, this gets complicated, but I always feel like this is the critical base to do. And it is so much easier than when we had to go to the buildings department automatically in person. So this is much more pleasant to start on this avenue. So we're going to look at some basic New York City records that you can access online. So the first is the Department of Information and Telecommunications, or Do It. And it basically is an accumulation of all sorts of information, financial records, building records, zoning records, what school district are you in, what congressional district are you in, what park are you nearby. There are all sorts of layers of information, which means that it's horribly slow to load. <laughs> So this most often is like the screen that I get, so you gotta be patient and come back maybe an hour later and then it finally loads. Um, but then you can right up there plug in the address or the cross streets that you wanna look at. And then here's what it does. It pulls up a map and it highlights your building. And you have a number of options. This is kind of the default mode. It shows this street map. So you see you know, our building in pinkish red there and then you can see the blocks and lots around it. You can also choose from any of these aerials, and they're going to be different, you know, depending on the neighborhood. So for instance, here's a 1924 aerial, and it shows our building again is automatically highlighted, and it shows that it's already there. On the far right is going to be just a whole kind of laundry list of information that again, they've pulled from various city records. Um, so there will be a year built, ignore it for the most part. Just really ignore it. It's actually fairly close, right, for our sample building. But for the most part, it's going to be wrong, especially for what you're looking for in Greenwich Village. If it was built before 1900, it pretty much defaults to 1900. So if you have an 1850s row house, it's going to say 1900. Um, or it will round up or down. So don't take that as gospel, um, but I will show you a step to kind of narrow down that actual build date. You can also then click an important in this whole laundry list, 
the ones, there are two that I use most frequently, and one of the most important is building profile. So you'll click through that menu, yeah, even wrong, click here, so you'll click on that building profile, and it will bring you to the building information system, which is basically the department of building system. You could go directly there if you want to, but this is a nice, easy way to get there. And this, again, is kind of a laundry list of information, but it's all about permits that have been filed, demolition records, are there violations on the building? This is where you find those kind of things. Um, so you can see the block and lot, which is absolutely critical information to have if you do have to go to a repository and look at things in person. For instance, if you want to look at the original conveyance records or you need to go to the buildings department, you need that block and lot. That's how things are categorized. It will tell you if it's um, a landmark or within a district. It's not always 100% reliable. I will say I always double check to make sure I'm looking at the right address when I link to it. It's not, it's not perfect, but it's a huge asset. And right at the top will be certificate of occupancy, and those can be really handy records. So if I click on that, I actually pull, find the original CFO for our sample building. And from that, I'm able to see that it was given in January 1922. So that kind of works with the build date that we found in the designation report, right, 1921. And it's adding to it the owner at the time, Martha Building Corp. So another detail I can put on my search list. And it will also give, you know, if you're lucky, it will tell you the number of stories, um, how are they, how is each floor occupied, that kind of level of detail. Some buildings might have four CFOs, they might have one, they might have none. So you just have to kind of click and see what you come up with. If we go back, we're going to go to the bottom to the action type. And it will pull up a whole list of different action types that we can look at. So you'll see there's um, plumbing, public assembly, you can find elevator permits, all of that kind of thing. But what we're looking for is the NB or the new building number. And that's what you want to click on. So you want to go through that action list and click on that NB number. And it will pull up this little list that has an NB number. Now the thing in the village is you might have more than one NB number. You might have, say, a row house that was built in the 1870s and then demolished in the 1930s for a garage and then that was demolished in the 1970s or 80s for an apartment building. So you do have to kind of have a sense of your building. But in this instance, there's one NB number. And that NB number is usually a row of numbers. You'll have a couple of numbers, then a dash, and then two numbers. The first number is the permit number, basically. It was the 220th new building built, and that 21 stands for 1921. And that gives you another clue that they filed for a new building permit in 1921. Now you can't click on that, unfortunately. It does, you can't click on it, it doesn't go anywhere. But it does give you some information, and there's another handy site that will do, that will, we can further flesh that out. Um, and we know that it's 1921 because there wouldn't be a building number for 1821. There wouldn't be an NB number. So that's the unfortunate thing with a lot of the research that I do. You know, it's pre-buildings department. So new building numbers are from like 1866 or so on. So if you're looking at a building that's earlier than that, you're not gonna find an NB number. But so we have that number, we've written it down, we've memorized it, and we're going to go for the Office for Metropolitan History, which Christopher Gray did an amazing thing, and he basically worked to digitize the building permits for Manhattan from 1900 to the 1980s. So our building fits in that window. So as long as we have that NB number, we can go to his website and do a search. And there are actually really good instructions on his website on how to do the search. So if you get there and you're not sure what you need to do, just look in the hints. And there are a lot of good hints there. Um, so we're going to plug in again the year. You have to write the full year, so 1921. The DOB number is, again, that first. Um, a set of numbers before the dash, so 220. So 
So we plug that in and up it comes. So this is the information that was filed with that building permit in 1921. So we have the construction permit date again, 1921. It gives us an architect at the time of filing. So we have Charles B. Myers and his address. The owner, Martha Building Corporation, and that ties in with that C of O, the certificate of occupancy that we saw, and a description of the building, as well as the cost of construction, and keeping in mind it's an estimate, right? So this is, they're filing the building permit. It doesn't mean that things don't change between filing and construction, but just being able to get to this level is pretty great. So if we pop back onto the Do It website um, and pull up that menu again, I mentioned the building profile I use very frequently. And then the next is the tax and property record. So if you really want to know about past mortgages on your property, any of that kind of financial information, you can click on that. And it will lead you to the city register information system ACRIS. Everything has schnazzy acronyms that you can find, and you can basically scroll through here. And it doesn't, again, guarantee that everything has been digitized yet, um, but what has, there's often a link to a PDF. So for this one, I just you know clicked on one, and it actually brought up the official notice of the designation of the historic district. So you can just scroll through and see what you can find. Maps. Um, so now that we have that basic information, right? We've built, we kind of have a construction date, we have an idea about the architect, the owner, we're building that baseline of information. We can go to what's often considered the fun stuff, the visual stuff. And we're fortunate, as I said, more and more things are being put online. So there are some that I particularly favor, you might favor others. But I've chosen a couple that maybe people are less likely to know about and that I find that I tend to use over and over again. So the first is the David Rumsey map collection. And they've been digitizing since the 90s. And it's actually globally focused, but they have a lot of New York City stuff. And the great thing about it is not every map site out there can you really zoom in and view in every, any detail. You kind of have to look at the pixelated version of maybe a large New York City map and you don't get the Greenwich Village detail. Um, on here you can actually zoom in and you can also download. Pretty good high resolution for reference, um, which is handy. So it has a little search mechanism and I just searched New York and um, you can then narrow it down by the date, by the location, all sorts of little search um, options for you. And here's one that from that site I just use an awful lot. It's the Matthew Drips map from 1852. It has a great level of detail for the village. You can see there's Washington Square Park. And then there is the block that we're looking at. And maps, again, are a great way to look at, oh, did any street names change? What streets were already through at what point? They're not infallible, but you start to build a picture of your block even before your building existed. Um, and so this one, again, I tend to use a lot. It's such a great resource for the village. Um, and then American Memory, the Library of Congress. Again, this is kind of US focused, so there's a lot out there, but there are some great New York City maps, and again, downloadable, and a lot of them um, are copyright free, which is great, an easy search mechanism. So you can just, I entered Manhattan. You can't always tell you know, if it's gonna be what you want, but it's worth clicking on. It'll bring up a little kind of summary. Um, this one, again, is one I use often. It's a very fun bird's eye view of Manhattan. So it's the entire island, 1879. Again, there's Washington Square Park. There's our block. And there is Jefferson Market Courthouse. So again, it gives you a great sense of the development of the neighborhood. And I could, you know, we could go through a million maps. They're very intriguing. Um, and then I don't want to forget the New York Public Library map division. Um, again, there are so many that we could go through. Um, we could be here for a couple of hours looking at each resource, which we don't have the time to do. Um, 
but they do, in addition to just great online resources, they do have great research guides as well. So if you don't know where to start with New York Public Library because they have so many maps, go to their map division homepage and they have um, like a guide to their New York City maps. They have all sorts of links so you can get directly to kind of the map that you need um, to work for you. Images. Um, again, so many great ones out there. Uh, the one I'm showing is um, 8th Street when it was a bookstore, right? The adult, it's still empty, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's still empty. Such a great site. Um, so that's a 1980s, I think, image of that corner. And these are fun, and they're, again, so many people are digitizing. They're becoming more and more accessible. And this is where the going down the wormhole of research kind of always gets me, right? You're just, oh, this is a great image, that's a great image. There's so many fabulous ones out there. I particularly like um, the Museum of the City of New York. They've been doing just a really fabulous job of digitizing their massive collection. It's a really easy searching platform. So you just go to their collections portal, as they call it, um, and enter your search term um, you know, by address, by architect name. You can just enter Greenwich Village. Um, you name it, you can kind of search by it. So I think I plugged in um, the address, and I did not find you know, our sample building, but here is 3 West 8th Street. Um, so it's on our street. And then the important thing about all of these to keep in mind when you're researching is that the da databases are not going to be perfect. They're put together by humans, right? And we all think in different ways. So handily, um, most of them will have keywords. So often, you know, I'll search, I don't find anything. I go to the keywords and look to see what else is kind of similar and related. In this instance, I clicked on A Street and there is actually um, not our building, but the building that was there before it being demolished so that our building could be constructed, um, which is great. So this is June of 1921, which again kind of works with the, the building permit that we saw, all of the information we've seen so far. So just to compare it, there's that um, image from MCNY and there's the site today. So you can start to build that visual, visual story, and again, MCNY, you can really zoom in on the images and get a really good level of detail. So you can look at signage and all of that kind of stuff. Um, New York Public Library, this one you may have heard about. It got a decent amount of press last year when it came online. A volunteer basically worked with New York Public Library to map their historic images so that you could actually go to this map, zoom in, click on a little dot, and then it brings up images that are around that area. So what I will say is it's fabulous. I tend to do both. I'll look at the New York Public Library digital gallery and use their searching platform and use this one. Which one is this? So this is um, oldnyc.org. And this is a volunteer worked um, with the New York Public Library to create this. Um, so it's really great. Again, I use it in conjunction because they aren't, you know, again, there'll be some things that are missing. But you, you know, click on a dot, you find an intersection, you click on a dot or two, and it brings up kind of a little slideshow of all the images that are kind of related to the dot that you've clicked. Then importantly, what it does, um, a number of things. You can actually, and I've done a few of these, um, they're transcribing some of the information on the back of the photos, so you can actually go in and, yeah, I see. What's the map called? What is the map? Well, it's called oldnyc.org is the name of the website. And that's where you would find the map? Yes, it's, it's not a, um, it's just a base map and the dots are there. Yep, so you just go to, go to oldnyc.org and it immediately will have that map with all sorts of red dots. And you can zoom in and out. Um, so then you click on a dot, it will bring this slideshow up for you. And you can look at an image. Um, if you want to help them out, you can do some suggested edits if you see a total flaw of information. But what is nice, if you click on the image, it will bring you back to New York Public Library, 
to their digital galleries, you get all that basic information. You get the copyright information, you get the date, you get all of that information, and you can zoom in on greater detail on the image as well. So again, it's, it's actually a fun search mechanism, because I think by having that map, you're much more likely to just go, oh, today I want to look on the Upper East Side. Today I want to, you know, and again, hours disappear. <laughs> so, so this is one that I found, which is kind of similar to that National Register image we saw from the 1970s. This is um, West 8th Street in the 1930s. So you start to build up this great kind of view of the neighborhood over time. And again, a lot of these you can really zoom in on a great level of detail of the images. And then another one that maybe isn't as well known, but I find very handy for Greenwich Village is the Digital Culture of Metropolitan New York. And they've been working with a lot of small archives, and even not so small archives, to get their collections digitized. So it's a search platform that covers a lot of different repositories. So some of them might be duplicates of things you've already searched. But then there are others that you wouldn't maybe have a search mechanism for. So for instance, for the village, they've got Sailor Snug Harbor archives. Or they've got the Whitney Museum Library. So they have some of these kind of smaller archives accessible. Um, so for instance, just doing a search for Greenwich Village, it's also um, a number of different mediums. So newspaper clippings, maps, photographs. And because they're constantly working with archives, they're constantly adding things to the database as well. So it's worth um, keeping that one on your radar. Newspapers. Um, this one I feel is the trickiest to, to do from the comfort of your own home. Um, it's possible, and I'll show you some of those, um, but there are many that you really will need to go to the New York Public Library to get free access to some of the really good databases or have a subscription. Um, but there are a number of resources out there. For those, for a number of them, they do honor copyright, which means that they're only going to have um, pre-1922, like 1923 accessible um, because they would still be in copyright by the owner. Um, others, if you go directly to the source, like the New York Times, you can search well um, past that. And some of them ignore the copyright altogether. So we've <laughs> got a little bit of a mix. Um, and this is a good time to bring up search terms. We've been you know, building up some of those terms, like who's the owner, who's the architect. Um, and while it's important with maps and images, with newspapers, it's really critical, at least for me, to really keep track of the terms I'm using when I search, because each database is a little funkier than the next. And it might make a difference whether you put a period after ST or you don't. Um, it can make a difference if you put something in quotation marks. So for instance, our building was, um, its name was Brevoort Court. So if we put that all in quotation marks, we'll pull up that phrase rather than just those two words. So it really helps to keep a list like this so you know, okay, I've searched all these terms on this database. It's still, I'm not guaranteeing you'll find everything, but you won't maybe go quite as crazy. Um, so this is one, if you can kind of look past the funky design of the website, which this like, <laughs> Joker kind of figure, it, it looks like something that you would immediately go off of because you thought it was like spam or something, but it's called Old Fulton New York History. It is not just about Fulton. Um, it's basically volunteers who have scanned hundreds of thousands of newspapers, ignoring copyright. And a lot of them are kind of the smaller, odd newspapers. So maybe a small newspaper in a town outside of the city. Or it might be some of the New York ones that are harder to find, like the Sun or the Herald Tribune. Um, so it really is a good resource. You definitely have to be patient with it. It is like a, a funky search mechanism, but you can really pull up some great stuff. Um, and there you can see how many they've digitized um, so far. Yeah, and it's all kind of volunteers um, putting stuff on there. So for instance, I did that search. I did Brevoort Court in quotation marks and came up with an ad 
for apartments for rent in our sample building in November of 1923. So it shows, you know, the address, 11 to 15 West 8th Street, three and four rooms, elevator apartments, the superintendent on premises. Um, so the newspapers, this particular Old Thornton, they do include a lot of these ad pages, which not every site is going to do. And these are the kind of pages that are honestly most helpful often because they're going to have those early ads for rentals. Sometimes you can find out how much they were charging in the 1930s for your apartment, which is always fascinating, mm -hmm. and just how they describe them, which is very fun. Um, New York Public Library, as I mentioned, they have a lot of research databases that are fabulous, but you do need to go in person. But I didn't want to ignore those because they are so great. But you can just go to their website and they have research and all the databases you can look at. One that I wanted to mention specifically for Greenwich Village is America's Historical Newspapers. And I use this all the time, particularly for the village and the early 19th century work that I do. Um, and it will tell you when you go to the database, where can I go? Do I have to go to a research library or are they going to have it at my branch library? Often these are at your branch library. So you can just go to Jefferson Market or whatever your branch library is. Um, and the America's Historical Newspapers, it has for New York City, you know, 1820s, 1830s. So I often find ads for sale or rents of early Greenwich Village row houses. And again, it will have a description of all modern amenities. You know, in the 1830s and marble fireplace, it will just have these really descriptive ads um, and often even estate sales. So if the land is being sold for development, you'll find that on there. Um, so this is when you have to go in person or um, sometimes if you have an alumni affiliation with the university, some alumni associations will have certain access to certain databases. Um, some of them have like JSTOR or ProQuest. This isn't often one of them, but it's worth checking. You can get it, because then you can stay at home. Um, Library of Congress, again, another one I really like. It does obey copyright, so it's pre-1920s only. But this one really does have, it has the Herald Tribune, it has the New York Sun, um, so I've had particular luck, um, like on the Upper West Side, and even in the village, finding buildings that were constructed in the 1920s, 19-teens, and fabulous ads for rent of those properties. And again, really easy search mechanism. You can limit it by state, because again, it's national. You can limit it by date, and it will just you know, pull up all of these options where your search terms appeared. I chose Charles Myers, our architect, who we think is our architect, and it pulls up an article about another building that he constructed. So we're starting to build another story about him. Again, with the caveat of just because it's in print in the newspaper does not mean it's true. Um, particularly if it's um, one of those wonderful articles about the village, like Bohemian history or you know romantic history of the village. It's going to have great stories but it may not be factually accurate, but I often use it to track back a story. So if there's a story in the village that I find, eh, I don't really believe that those houses on 11th Street were built for the five daughters of Henry Bevort Jr., like tracking that story back through the newspapers and seeing where it first appears is really helpful. So other publications, there are a lot of great things out there that, um, that are great use. There's been a lot obviously written about the village, whether it's an early 20th century book or a more recently, more recent scholarly article or manuscripts. If you know someone in particular that you're looking for, um, looking at their manuscripts at New York Historical Society or New York University. Um, Internet Archive. So this comes into the personal preference thing. I really prefer this to Google Books. Um, it's a great way to view the book. Um, you find not only books, but media of different sorts on it. Sometimes you could Google something, and if it shows that you can view it in Google Books or view it in archive.org, I always choose archive.org. Um, you can see just, what did I search? Greenwich Village. So it has movies, it has text, it has images, concerts. Um, I think I've watched one of the films before. Um, and then collections. 
And so this is um, this is also where it gets dangerous because there's so many fabulous publications in the village, right? So this is, I think, 1918. So it's before the building um, was constructed, but I had the excuse of, oh, it's building color, right? It's building color. <laughs> So this is the little book of Greenwich Village, and this is great. You can just flip through page by page. Um, you can search if you want to see when something appears, and then all these little tabs will tell you what page to go to. So I searched West 8th Street, and it gave me all these little options, and then you can click on them, pull up that page, and I find 19 West 8th Street, three steps down, one of the most popular gathering places for villagers. So it's describing restaurants that were on 8th Street in 1918, which is kind of fabulous. Um, Columbia University has a couple of resources that are really fabulous to know about um, and may not be kind of commonly out there. So you kind of have to know that they have them. But if you're looking at a building that's kind of 1860s to 1920s, the Real Estate Record Guide is a great resource for information on mortgages, building transfers, kind of some of that kind of technical so-and-so deeded such and such for such and such price kind of information. And you can again, like I limited it, I looked for Martha Building, which was our owner, right? And I narrowed it down to 1920 to 22 to see what would come up. All sorts of options came up, including um, a conveyance record. So it tells me who, in 1920, sold that property to Martha Building Corporation. And it also tells me that there were three to four story brick tenements on the property when they sold it. Um, so there's no guarantee that yours is going to be in there, but again, try lots of different search options I chose um, because I knew the owner that would most likely appear within a conveyance, like a land transfer record, so that's what I used for that. Um, and then another Columbia University resource guide is the Real Estate Brochure Collection, which is very fun. Um, it's 1920s to 1970s. Um, it's not going to cover every building, but if you are lucky enough to have your building show up, they are basically the original sales pitches for these buildings. So brochures with floor plans, elevations, descriptive language about amenities, um, it's, it's an outdated language about the type of people they are hoping live in their buildings, right? So all sorts of interesting things. And it's, again, very easy to search. You can search um, by borough. You can you know, plug in an address. You can also go to places and people and look at the neighborhood. So for the West Village, there are 109. Um, again, I usually search all of those because they may classify something as West Village and you don't. It doesn't mean your building isn't, isn't in there. Um, so as an example, I just pulled up, you know, our sample building was not in there, but I pulled up this Greenwich Towers on West 13th Street and it has a great little prospectus. It showed floor plans for a full floor as well as some of the individual apartments. So these again would be as they were built, as they were first selling them. Um, and again, for this particularly, there are plenty in the village and then particularly for the Upper West Side, Upper East Side, there are some fun ones as well. So it's definitely a resource to kind of play around with. You can also search by architect, which is great. So our architect appears, even though it's not the building that we're using as our sample building, you can see, oh, what, what else was that architect working on? Were they of similar style? Was he working in the same neighborhood? Was he or she working with the same developer? Kind of build up that picture. Um, and then the AIA historical directory. I threw this one in. Again, it's not going to show up all the time, but I feel it's one of those that it's worth trying because you don't know what might be on there. Um, they have um, this historical you know, directory, and members were asked often to fill out surveys that talked about when did they become an architect, what were some of their properties, where was their office, all that kind of information. And fortunately, our architects, Charles Myers, he filled one out. So we know what year he started, um, what he considered his you know, prime buildings to be, no surprise, our West 8th Street building is not included on that list. <laughs> it's one of those more modest um, buildings. 
Um, but you can get a sense of even the, um, I think there are their locations, their owners, um, there's some values on there. Um, so you never know what you're going to turn, turn up. And this is something the architect filled out and then scanned and sent to the AIA. So it's worth kind of looking. So this one is from 1946, a little questionnaire. And then social history, which I want to include, but I'm not going to be able to give it's due, because that's a whole other lecture, really. But I don't want us to forget that they aren't just buildings. People inhabit these buildings. And knowing about those people adds so much to the story. But you know, genealogy and all those records, it's a whole other type of search. Um, but there are some resources out there. Some of them are free and accessible um, you know, at New York Public Library in person. Some of them um, you know, on a fee-based service, um, and then New York City directories are becoming increasingly digitized, and those are a fabulous resource, as well as, again, manuscripts. Um, so for census record, for instance, for our building, it's built about 2122, so I can't use the 1920 census, but I can pull up the, um, the 1930 census, and finding in that address, it tells me how many people were living in the building? What were their professions? Where were they born? You know, what mix of immigrants or non-immigrants do we have? How many children are within a household? All of that kind of information, which kind of gives you that um, picture of the building. And also because it's generally geographic, you can see, okay, what's happening in the buildings around it as well. So this I pulled from Ancestry.com, but again, you can pull from New York Public Library. And I'm almost through. Do you mind? Is, yeah. I just want curious yeah. how, how you search by address. So this is where it gets more complicated, but you can do it. So we can talk about that later, but you basically have to know the enumeration district. Okay. And then you can. And there's a really handy, um, Stephen Morse, I think, created this great for New York. You can go in and plug in your cross streets. And the year you want to look um, at the census, and it will give you the enumeration district. Then you have to go to the census and look at that enumeration district and basically scroll through until you, yeah. So that's what I had to do this for this. Since I didn't know the last name of anybody who lived there, I had to find the correct block to look at. Um, and then again, New York City directory. So for instance, this is a 1922-1923 directory that's available at um, archive.org. So that's a great resource. They're, they also have 1830s, 1830s, 1820s um, directories on archive.org. So I use those a lot for early 19th century. And again, they're searchable. It's not a perfect search, but it saves reading through every single entry if you're looking for an address. Um, and 1946 telephone directory, which I thought was really fun to throw in there. Bless you. Um, so what did we uncover so far about our building? We have, after quickly running through all of those, we think we have a construction date and we have a primary source and a secondary source about that. We have a possible architect. He's um, listed on the building permit. Um, we know some of his other work. We know the owner at the time of construction because it's listed on the building permit and the certificate of occupancy. And then it's also in the real estate uh, record and guide. So in a short amount of time, obviously it took me longer to do that than present it to you. But still, I didn't. Um, I kind of kept myself on a tight time frame of just doing one kind of quick search and not doing these five-hour slogs, um, which are easy to do. So I kept it pretty tight, and I was able to come up with this information in a relatively short amount of time. So again, now you have a framework if you feel like, oh, I want to go to a repository in person, you have this starting point. And you can look now at all these repositories at their you know, online catalogs to see what they might have that, um, that works for you. Um, so some final tips. Um, this has been kind of a race through a lot of resources. There are more out there, and there are always <laughs> more coming. Um, and so you can keep using that NPC resource sheet, and there'll always be updates. Um, use GVSHP's website. It absolutely is going to be for you in Greenwich Village. It's going to have kind of that first step of information. 
That's really going to be valuable. Uh, be skeptical. Don't forget that one. Um, track the information and where you found it. Um, that can be a difficult thing when you're excited about finding something and then you forget where you found it two months later. Um, and gather as many primary sources as possible so you can really nail down some of that information. And then step away from the computer. 